Thanks for coming to my talk today. Um, so today you're going to learn all about real-time machine learning and be introduced to an open source library called River. Um, and it demands a very progressive audience because uh, online machine learning is very different to maybe the machine learning you've already heard about. So first of all, a bit about me. My name is Tun Shui. I'm the VP of data at Quix, and I also look after DevRel. Uh, Quix is a developer tools company, so we help Python developers work with real-time data in Kafka. And my background is in data engineering, and I was a head of data as well. So I worked at high-growth startups, where I helped them implement their data strategy um, using real-time data where appropriate. And uh, my areas of interest are naturally around real-time data and the AI ecosystem. And it seems like, um, I mean, if you go to the talks here, it seems like there's a brand new library or startup every single month coming out in this space. So um, I, I'm a big fan of keeping an eye on this landscape. Um, so if you like to do the same, then please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, the other thing I do is I organize the Berlin Stream Processing Meetup. Um, so we try to do this every other month or so. And uh, we're listed as a satellite event on the uh, Berlin Buzzwords um, events page. So if you like what you see and you'd like to know more about stream processing, please join the meetup. The next one is tomorrow. OK, uh, first of all, can I get a show of hands if you recognize any of those and have deployed them in production? OK, good selection of the room. Um, so. Um, to kind of bring everyone on the same page, I'm going to go into a bit of a background on stream processing. So uh, with real-time data, uh, normally you have to put it somewhere. So traditionally, you would put things into a database. But in the streaming data world, you put it into a message broker. So the really popular one that's been around for about 13 years is Apache Kafka. And um, close on its heels as well is Apache Pulsar. Now, they come from a Java um, background. Uh, so the whole data landscape for streaming data naturally is based on Java and Java virtual machine languages. Um, but in the last few years, you've had the emergence of these other types of stream brokers. So Red Panda is one of them, and Warp Stream is one of them. They don't have Java in their stack at all. So Red Panda would, um, uses uh, C++, so the library's written completely from scratch, completely compatible with the Kafka API, but in C++. And Warp Stream is written in Golang. So um, you have this whole streaming landscape, and what we're seeing now is an emergence of a new type of data engineer. And um, I've spoken to a few people in the room here, actually, about what their job title is. Um, so I come from a kind of what I would consider a classical uh, data engineering background, which is um, kind of almost like a legacy stack with Hadoop and Spark, uh, tools like that. But the software engineers who work with data that I speak to today are kind of accidental data engineers. Um, they work with microservices. They work with a very different tool chain. But um, what they don't normally work with is um, Java. They've started to work with Rust and lots of different other li libraries like Golang. And Python's the one I see really often. And that was really what Quix's mission is. It's to um, help all the Python developers of the world come to streaming and use real-time data. Because before, it was just ignored. It was um, always a wrapper around a Java library or something like that. Um, and Python makes sense, because a lot of um, the data world, um, especially data science, those libraries uh, were uh, battles that were four and one in the Python landscape. So you've got all these libraries that are in production today that have been well battle tested, um, and they're on Python. So that's where Quick Streams was born. So uh, we developed this. Um, it's an open source library, and we developed this to suit those developers who um, don't come from a Java background but need to work with real time data. Uh, we made the conscious decision to make it 100% pure Python, so it doesn't have. Um, it's not wrapped around other languages. Um, which means that you get the benefits of line-by-line -line debugging. So as a developer, as you're learning, um, you never come up with the final product in one day. You iterate your way there, and you iterate your way to the final product through debugging and getting things wrong, right? Um, and so we, we went with Python and going Pythonic just so you could debug easily and get to that end goal. Um, so it's really great for beginners and newcomers to stream, to, uh, uh, stream processing. And we're pushing this concept of streaming data frames. Um, if people have not worked with data frames before, um, it's, a, it's a tabular representation of your data. Um, so you take the streaming data and you kind of make it into a table format. And if you have used PySpark and uh, libraries like Pandas, you'd be familiar with this kind of notation. So here we've got an output topic, which is where um, you write your um, event-based like streaming data to. And you get that turned into a data frame. And from there, you can apply column-based um, transformations to it. And as well, you know, write it back out to a topic. 
Uh, we've also implemented uh, stateful operations, so things like window functions, so they're quite uh, a common use case uh, out there, common operation where you need to maintain state, find aggregations such as uh, minimums, uh, maxes, means over a period. So uh, we provide uh, access to a high-level state object to enable you to do those custom aggregations. And um, as a developer, you may be preoccupied with building the business logic out, and you may care less about infrastructure. So that's where Quicks Cloud would come in. So we provide a fully managed solution for that too. Because um, all your applications will be built um, according to our framework as um, Dockerized applications, and you can assemble them in a pipeline. And uh, if you use Quicks Cloud, we make all of that really easy for you with the CI CD parts all taken care of for you. So with that background, um, let's go into what is offline, also known as batch machine learning. Um, I'm going to break that down into two sections. So there's online inference, which is kind of like the uh, predictions that you're making, and uh, the learning, how the model is trained. So first of all, um, offline inference. So um, what it is is the predictions are generated from batched observations. You generate many predictions at the same time, usually, and the predictions are not available for real-time purposes. So an example would be when I used to work in recommender systems um, in one of my previous workspace, uh, workplaces, we use Spark to um, pre-generate recommendations for the whole user base. And uh, once they were generated, they were put into a data store behind an API, and at some point in the future, um, an email, a schedule would kick in, and it would read from that API and, and send emails out um, with the recommendations to all the users. So that would be an example of offline inference. Um, offline learning, um, this is the most common type. This is probably the type you're most familiar with um, for machine learning. It's when you fit a model over uh, static, also known as historic, also known as unbounded data. So you've got batches of observations that are all processed in one go at the same time. Uh, let's zoom in to offline learning a bit. So here we are fitting a model over static data, and you are dealing with batches of uh, observations at a time. It requires a lot of memory, because usually you have a lot of historical data that you're trying to train your model on. And to do that, you need to figure out how to deal with it. Um, it doesn't always fit into memory, which is why tools like uh, Spark exist. Uh, they allow you to partition the data, break it down into chunks, and, um, and, pr and compute everything through uh, parallel workers. And um, the bounded data is really easy to reason about. So you could get a data set that encompasses like a whole calendar year of, of observations, for example. So it's really easy. It's a very human way to approach a data set. Um, it's got lots of well-established processes and tooling. Because um, machine learning really was born from, um, and it used to be called pattern recognition. It was born from data analysis. So you'd always have static data that you would analyze. And over time, you wanted to get more advanced. So you would start forecasting and making predictions. And that's where machine learning came from. So inherently, you're always working with data sets that are static. And that's why data science and um, machine learning um, with batch is so deeply intertwined. And it's a mentality that um, is often difficult to shift from, hence why I say it's a progressive audience here. Um, and the most important fact is offline learning, the traditional sort of machine learning, it fits 99% of use cases. Uh, I just made that number up. It's probably more like 99.999. Like it, it fits most use cases. But we're here to talk a bit about the use cases it does not fit. So onto online or streaming machine learning. Um, before going online, let's talk about let's think about conceptually how data works. Now, if you think um, in your current projects uh, or your or your place of work, how you actually deal with data. So that data is probably generated in real time. So it might be a click stream, it might be an event, it might be a measurement taken from a sensor. Like that data is created in real time, and it typically stays in motion. So it's moving, it's moving. And then it's pushed into an at rest state. So you push it into a database, uh, you push it into cloud storage, you slow it down essentially. And then you schedule it to be processed in batches. So you look at a few at a time or, or large batches at a time. So the question is, why don't you deal with data when it's in motion? Like that second point there, whilst it's moving, why not process it at that point? Um, the answers I always get, um, I had a separate talk for this, but the summary is it's complex and difficult. Um, Kafka, technologies like that, they're distributed systems. Um, and I found that when I speak to um, lots of developers out there, thinking in four dimensions, thinking with time is really difficult. We, we struggle with that as humans. And so online machine learning, uh, again, we'll break it up into two sections. So online inference, this is also known as real-time predictions. Um, it's when you use the model to make predictions on demand. 
So um, usually you need to uh, make that really quick. So you would fetch the necessary features at the time of the request. So you use uh, feature stores, uh, things like Hopsworks. And for online learning, also known as real-time training, uh, you're fitting a model over streaming or unbounded data. And the most important concept that you have to walk away with today is that you are learning one observation or data point at a time. Uh, let's zoom into inference. Um, when I ask developers, do you do real-time machine learning? Uh, they usually say yes, and what they actually mean is um, online inference, uh, because it's really straightforward to do. Um, it works with batch models um, that pre-compute these predictions that you would have created with offline learning. And um, it just has a really mature tooling ecosystem for things like model selection. You are, in online learning, uh, fitting a model over streaming data, and you're learning one observation at a time. And like most people don't do this. So you get the observations that come in in order. And you would either make a prediction, or if you had the label. So here we've got uh, the x and the y. If you're familiar with scikit-learn, it will be uh, your feature and your target variable. When you have your ground truths come in, you start learning. So oftentimes, the ground truth is not always available at that point. Um, with a recommender system, you're waiting for someone to click through on that recommendation to know it's a good one. So your ground truth is delayed. And not all algorithms are suitable. Um, it naturally works really well with unsupervised methods, because you, you don't have labels. Um, but the supervised uh, methods do work, but they require some thought, because the labels will arrive later. And since the data is streamed in, there are lots and lots of unknowns. Um, with uh, online machine learning, you tend to just accept what you get, and you deal with it. So each data point that comes in could always be the same schema, or it could change completely. Um, it could have the same features, or features will disappear. And um, sometimes they appear and they disappear over time. So it can be confusing when you look at data as it's kind of changing. But um, whilst it might be confusing at first, that's also its strength. Um, there are some benefits for using online machine learning um, that don't normally fit into kind of like the batch mentality. So you don't need historical data at all. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of the times when I, I work with developers, um, the first thing they've got to figure out is the data set. Like, where's my data set? How do I train my model? Find the right data set. Um, if you don't have a, 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 that data set, or nor do you need one, you know, real-time machine learning is a great one. So if you have uh, sort of hobby projects, uh, for example, like if you have a Raspberry Pi and you want to do um, kind of environmental sensoring, like monitoring, um, you don't have historical data for your room or your house. You could just get started with machine learning today, like just, just using online machine learning. Um, naturally, it requires less CPU and memory because you're not holding so many um, records, so much data in memory. You're looking at the observations as they come in one at a time. And they're great because they adapt to new data and trends. Um, you contrast that with batch where the data is fitted to a model, and then it will need to be retrained from scratch later by appending the new data that has since arrived with the old historical data. Um, with online machine learning, it adapts over time. Um, as soon as new data comes in, the model is updated, so there's no delay. Um, so it doesn't require retraining. And um, one of the, I would say the second most important point here is that it's really resilient to model and concept drift. So um, concept drift is where the underlying distribution in the data, it changes over time. And there are changes um, in the relationship between the feature and the target variable. And what happens is this causes a degradation in the prediction function. Um, so you start getting like erroneous and like incorrect. And you don't quite hit the mark with your prediction. So normally, in a batch scenario, you'd have to retrain. But with online machine learning, you can start adapting with that over time. Um, this is really good for things like, I mean, during the pandemic, um, there would have been concept drift as people change their behaviors, say at home, their shopping habits changed. Um, the best machine learning systems would use online learning and figure out this stuff really early and start adapting to the environment. Um, so yeah, the model is a stateful, ever-changing object. It just keeps changing. Here are some use cases. Um, so anomaly detection, so it's really common in industrial IoT and banking. So if you use um, half-space trees, um, that's a really good way to get going with uh, anomaly detection, um, as well as recommended systems. Personalization, which is essentially a specialization of recommendation systems with a reward function, and dynamic pricing. So you can do all of these use cases. Um, so we get to batch and stream, offline and online. Um, I, I use the word and, but sometimes like I hear the word versus, like because they always seem like they're enemies of each other. But actually, you use them 
together at the same time. Batch and stream are complementary, and one does not replace the other. And most teams, what I found is they try to fit streaming into a batch system. Um, but I find that it's much easier to fit batch into a streaming system because in my mind, um, you're taking data and you're slowing it down. So batch is actually a specialized, it's a specialization. It's a specialized subset of streaming. And um, here, we, my summary here is that offline solves most machine learning problems, but online solves problems where context is important, especially current context. So uh, my last few slides are about River. So let's talk about River. So um, before River, there were these two projects. So there was Cream, uh, which was a project which had the mission of pro providing pure online machine learning models. And then there was Scikit Multiflow, which dealt with online machine learning models, but also some offline ones as well. Um, so the project leads got together and merged, and River was born. Um, and here are its concepts and benefits. So um, they focused on great developer experience. They were heavily inspired by Scikit-Learn. So um, if you've used Scikit-Learn, you're going to see the code and you're going to find that very familiar. It was great for general purpose ML tasks. So regression, um, classification, unsupervised learning. It can be used for lots of ad hoc tasks like uh, calculating rolling metrics, things like that. And it's great for um, lots of different models around anomaly detection, time series forecasting, those sort of predictions. They're really good for that. Um, they cope really well with concept drift. As I mentioned, there's some drift packages that you can import. Um, there's uh, support for adaptive windowing, things like that, that will help. And everything's a dictionary. Um, that's probably the third mind-blowing moment. Like everything is a dictionary. Now, sit with that for a moment. Um, here's an example um, of a data set. So it comes preloaded with data sets that you can import in. So here's one for New York Taxi. So you see it's all JSON there. And one for a phishing data set. Um, again, it's all JSON. Uh, everything being a dictionary makes the features really explainable. Um, in offline machine learning, you normally have to go through a step where you vectorize everything. Everything gets turned into a number, and that works with libraries like NumPy, etc. Um, but for uh, this concept of looking at data as it comes in one at a time, you don't need to vectorize. You can't vectorize, in fact. So you might as well keep everything as a string. So keeping it as um, a primitive um, that's, um, that you see in Python makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, the great thing is when features appear and disappear, you see them appear and disappear <laughs> in, in the actual JSON as well. So as a human, really easy to debug. And this is a model. Models are also uh, JSON objects. So there's an example of that on the right. You can see those weights there. Um, and I mentioned that the um, online model is a stateful object. So since they're dictionaries, you can deal with new observations by adding another weight to the dictionary. So a new observation comes in, new weight will appear. Um, you can take a trained model and easily pickle it or dump the file to JSON and save it um, in an external data store. So versioning and reverting back to previous models is really easy. It's all in JSON. And um, you'll see now that it's really reminiscent of scikit-learn. You um, can predict one. You learn, but here you would learn one when you have the, the label. Uh, normally, you would compute your own metrics by keeping um, a store of the predictions with the store of the actuals and do it manually, but River gives you the ability to do that. Here, um, I'm using um, an accuracy metric, which is basically the percentage of exact matches. So what you can do is you create your prediction, and um, if you have a labeled data set, you would learn as you go. So uh, when you get an observation, you determine if this is something you want to learn from or something you need to predict. So um, pretty straightforward there. And uh, you've got pre-processing scalars. So scalars are really important. You want to start normalizing the data a little bit. So you've got things like a min-max scalar. Here I'm using a standard scalar in a pipeline so that the model uh, will use this pipeline every time a new observation comes in. It will get scaled, and then it will use this logistic regression model in this case. And you can do progressive validation. So to evaluate the model performance, um, where the target is revealed to the model after it's made its prediction. So to test how well the model performs in production, you can introduce a delay so that the ground truth label comes in some time later, which is representative of real-time cases. So you can here um, simulate it and have it print every 10 seconds so you can see the accuracy change over time. So it's pretty neat. So last few slides are uh, your onward learning paths here. So if you go to Rivers documentation, um, there's loads of different recipes for doing lots of different things like active learning, rolling computations, etc. They've got an amazing API with uh, loads of different algorithms loaded and implemented ready for you to use. Um, like I mentioned, half space trees before for anomaly detection. You've got lots of other things there like uh, SVMs. And uh, yeah. 
this is where you need to go to learn more about River. So uh, this was my last slide. Yeah, please show your support there and star them and check out their documentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, do we want Thank to you. take Let's some questions? Yeah, Why some not? Questions. It's over time, but... Um, I have two questions. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, two questions. The first one is, can you configure different data refreshing um, intervals for different features? So say that I want to refresh some features um, in a real-time manner and other features in a batch manner. Is it possible to do both of those together? And then the other question is, what do you do if there, or I guess, do you deal with the case when state exceeds memory at all? Right, interesting. Okay, so for the first one, um, I've not seen it in practice. I tend to use separate models, so we don't try and reconcile batch with streaming in any way. Um, I think when you're working with the different, like the models in River, you can see they're all JSON, so it's hard to make them interoperate with the other models. So I'll just run them um, you know, in parallel, and then you can um, actually just measure their performance. Um, it's well known that um, if you use batch um, batch learning, the evaluation through evaluation, you find that that's actually more accurate. So what you would do is you would use the online machine learning model for the current context important stuff. And then even overnight, you might want to retrain in batch with the new observations. So you would constantly have batch catching up behind it. Um, so you get the best of both worlds. Um, your second question was, uh, sorry, it's slipped my mind. Oh, the second question was, uh, do you deal with the case when state exceeds memory? Right. Uh, I've not really seen that. I mean, because everything's in um, essentially in JSON, uh, you would have to have like so many features. Um, in practice, you wouldn't try to use so many features. You would try to clean that up and do your actual feature engineering to select the features you would care about. Um, certainly in the early days, if you have so many features, you probably just want to have a go and it may run out of memory then. And then over time, you realize these are the features that are important and start focusing on those in your pipeline. Sorry, uh, just to clarify, uh, I was more thinking about like if you're doing large window aggregations or something, um, it's, I guess, if you're doing like a month aggregations or sometimes a year, depending on the application, um, it is. Got you, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah, that wouldn't be a feature of River. It would be pro more a feature of quick streams in this case, or your actual stream processor. So how that, that system would manage memory would be um, the answer there. Like quick streams um, has a, it uses um, checkpointing and change logs in Kafka. So we offset some of it and some of the local storage is in RocksDB. So yeah, we, we kind of do both. So it depends on the stream processes, the answer. Thank you, Tun, for this Thanks great so talk. We are running